It was a typical Thursday evening when my life began to unravel. After a long day at work, I returned home to find my wife, Olivia, dressed in a stunning red dress, her makeup flawlessly applied. This wasn't her usual look for a weeknight, and my heart skipped a beat. Tom, we have dinner reservations at seven, she said with a mysterious smile. I racked my brain, trying to remember if I'd forgotten an anniversary or a birthday, but nothing came to mind. Regardless, I played along, quickly changing into my best suit, trying to match her elegance. Dinner was at our favorite restaurant, an intimate Italian place downtown. The atmosphere was warm with the soft glow of candlelight and the murmur of hushed conversations around us. The food was excellent, but I could sense something was off. Olivia was quieter than usual, her eyes darting around the room, as if looking for an escape. Finally, as we sipped our coffee, I leaned in and said, All right, Olivia. What's going on? You can tell me. She took a deep breath, her eyes welling up with tears. Tom, I think you should know. Greg is back. My stomach dropped. Greg? The name felt like a punch to the gut. Greg, her high school sweetheart, the one who had always been a shadow in our marriage. I stared at her, waiting for the other shoe to drop. When you say back, you mean he's visiting? I asked, my voice barely steady. She shook her head slowly. No, Tom. He's moved back. He bought a house two streets away. I felt a wave of nausea. And you've seen him. She nodded, her eyes avoiding mine. Yes, he stopped by the house yesterday. The room seemed to spin, and I gripped the edge of the table to steady myself. Olivia, did you sleep with him? I asked, my voice breaking. She looked up at me, tears streaming down her face. No, Tom, I didn't. But it's not what you think. He needed me. He's going through a tough time with his divorce, and he just needed someone to talk to. I took a deep breath, trying to process the betrayal I felt. And you still love him, I said, more a statement than a question. She nodded, unable to meet my gaze. I love you, Tom, but I realize I never stopped loving Greg. The words hum in the air, a painful truth that cut deeper than any knife. I looked at the woman I had loved for over 30 years, the mother of my child, and felt my world shatter. Okay, Olivia, I said, my voice cold and detached. The damage is done. We can get through this, but you can never see him again. Do you understand? She looked at me with those tearful eyes, shaking her head. Tom, I can't promise that. He needs me, and I need to help him. I stood up abruptly, my chair scraping against the floor, drawing the attention of nearby diners. Then I don't know what to say to you, Olivia. Maybe it's time we figure out what we both really want. With that, I turned and walked out of the restaurant, leaving Olivia sitting there, her tears reflecting the candlelight. As I stepped into the cool night air, I knew our lives would never be the same again. The next morning, I woke up with a heavy heart. The events of the previous night felt like a bad dream, but the empty space beside me in bed confirmed that it was all too real. Olivia had slept in the guest room, and the silence between us was deafening. I went through my morning routine on autopilot, trying to keep my mind off the painful conversation that awaited us. When I walked into the kitchen, Olivia was already there, sipping her coffee and staring out the window. She turned when she heard me enter, her eyes red and puffy from crying. Tom, we need to talk, she said softly. I nodded, sitting down at the table across from her. I'm listening. She took a deep breath, her hands trembling as she set down her cup. I've been thinking about this all night. I need some time, Tom. Time to figure things out to sort through my feelings for both you and Greg. Time? I asked, my voice tinged with bitterness. What does that mean, Olivia? She looked down at her hands, unable to meet my gaze. I need a break. A year, maybe to be with Greg to see if what we had was real or just a fantasy from the past. I need to do this, Tom. For my sanity, for us. I felt like the ground had been pulled out from under me. A year? You want to take a year off from our marriage to be with another man? Tears streamed down her face as she nodded. I know it sounds crazy, but I need to know. I need to see if there's something still there with Greg. But I also need to be sure about us. I love you, Tom. I really do. But I'm torn. My first instinct was to say no, to tell her that she couldn't just walk out on 30 years of marriage. But as I looked into her eyes, I saw how lost she was, how much she was struggling. Maybe giving her this time would be the only way to truly know if our marriage could survive. All right, Olivia, I said slowly, the words tasting bitter in my mouth. If this is what you need, then fine. But there are conditions. You can't come back and forth. You make your choice and you stick with it. No contact between us for the entire year. 
You'll be completely out of my life during that time. Do you understand? She nodded, fresh tears spilling over. I understand, Tom. Thank you. I promise I'll come back to you. This is just something I have to do. I stood up, feeling a strange mix of anger, sadness, and relief. Then I guess this is goodbye for now. Olivia stood as well, walking over to me. She reached up and kissed me on the cheek. Goodbye, Tom. I'm so sorry. I turned away, unable to look at her any longer. As I walked out of the kitchen, the weight of her decision settled heavily on my shoulders. I felt like I was being crushed under the enormity of it all. A year without my wife, without knowing if she would come back or if I would even want her by then. That night, I lay in bed alone, staring at the ceiling, wondering how my life had come to this. The woman I loved was leaving me for another man, and all I could do was hope that the time apart would somehow bring us back together. It was a slim hope, but it was all I had left. The first few days after Olivia left were a blur. I went through the motions at work, trying to focus on my job as an insurance adjuster, but my mind was constantly drifting back to her. Every corner of our home felt emptier, colder without her presence. Her scent lingered in the air, a painful reminder of what I had lost. On the third day, I decided I needed to take action. I couldn't just sit around and wallow in my misery. I went to the hardware store and bought new locks for the doors. Changing them felt symbolic, like I was taking control of at least one part of my life. As I worked, I tried not to think about the fact that I was locking Olivia out of our home, out of my life. Next, I made an appointment with a lawyer. I needed to understand my options to protect myself in case this year-long separation turned into something more permanent. The lawyer was a sharp, no-nonsense woman named Rebecca, who listened to my story with a professional detachment. Tom, given the circumstances, we can draft a separation agreement that outlines your financial responsibilities and sets clear boundaries, she said. It's important to protect your interests during this time. I nodded, feeling a little more in control. Thank you, Rebecca. That sounds like a good plan. Returning home, I felt a sense of grim determination. I had taken the first steps to reclaim my life, but the house still felt unbearably empty. I spent hours cleaning, organizing, trying to keep myself busy. I avoided our bedroom, opting to sleep in the guest room instead. The bed we had shared for so many years felt too large, too full of memories. Joan, our daughter, called frequently. She was worried about me, and I did my best to reassure her. Dad, are you sure you're okay? She asked one evening, her voice filled with concern. I'm hanging in there, Joan, I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Just taking things one day at a time. She sighed. I can't believe Mom did this. It doesn't seem real. I know, honey. But we'll get through it. Just focus on taking care of yourself and the baby. Joan was pregnant with her first child, and the thought of becoming a grandfather was one of the few things that brought me any joy. I clung to that hope, imagining holding my grandchild and feeling some semblance of happiness again. One evening, as I sat in the living room, sipping a glass of whiskey, the phone rang. It was Joan again. Dad, I've been thinking, she said he said Henley. Why don't you come stay with us for a while? It might help to get away from the house. I appreciated her offer, but I knew that staying with Joan and her husband, Frank, would only remind me more of what I had lost. Thanks, Joan, but I need to handle this on my own. Being here, facing everything, it's part of the process. She sighed. I understand, Dad. Just promise me you'll take care of yourself. I promise, I said, hoping I could keep that promise. Days turned into weeks, and slowly, I began to establish a new routine. I threw myself into my work, taking on extra projects to fill the hours. I joined a gym, hoping physical activity would help clear my mind. I even started cooking more, experimenting with recipes Olivia had always wanted to try but never got around to. One Friday evening, after another long week, I decided to treat myself to a night out. I went to Flynn's, an upscale tavern in the city. It was a place Olivia and I had often visited, but tonight I needed to reclaim it for myself. As I sat at the bar, nursing a barbin, I noticed a couple walk in, holding hands and looking very much in love. It took a moment for my brain to register who they were. Greg and Olivia. They didn't see me at first, too engrossed in each other. I watched them for a moment, feeling a mixture of anger and sadness. Then Olivia saw me. Her eyes widened, and she looked away quickly, as if hoping I hadn't noticed her. I took a deep breath and approached them. Olivia, Greg, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Greg looked up, his expression hardening. Tom, he said curtly. 
Olivia looked like she wanted to sink into the floor. Tom, I... It's fine, I interrupted, not wanting to make a scene. I just wanted to say hello. Greg stepped closer, his posture aggressive. You made my woman cry last time, Tom. I don't like that. Your woman. I repeated, feeling a surge of anger. She's still my wife, Greg. Or have you forgotten that? Greg's face reddened, and for a moment, I thought he was going to hit me. But then the manager came over, sensing the tension. Is everything all right here? No problem, I said, stepping back. Just a little misunderstanding. As I returned to my seat, I felt a strange sense of victory. I hadn't backed down. I had stood my ground. It wasn't much, but it was something. Back at home, I poured myself another drink and sat down with a box of old letters and photos Olivia had left behind. As I sorted through them, I found letters from Greg dating back years. It became clear that this vacation with Greg had been in the works for a long time. One letter, dated five years ago, read, Olivia, I can't wait until we're together again. You need to find a way to leave Tom. He doesn't deserve you. Reading those words felt like a knife to the heart, but it also gave me a strange sense of closure. This wasn't just a sudden decision by Olivia. It was something she had been planning for years. The next day, I called Rebecca, my lawyer. Rebecca, let's move forward with the divorce, I said. I'm ready. As I hung up the phone, I felt the weight lift off my shoulders. It was time to move on to start rebuilding my life without Olivia. It wouldn't be easy, but I was determined to find happiness again. No matter how long it took, the days following my decision to proceed with the divorce felt like a whirlwind. I threw myself into work even harder, finding solace in the structure and predictability of my job. But every evening as the sun set and the house grew quiet, the reality of my situation would crash over me like a relentless tide. One Saturday afternoon, I was at the gym, pushing myself through another grueling workout, when my phone buzzed. It was a text from Joan. Dad, can you come over for dinner tonight? Frank and I want to talk to you about something. I agreed, knowing I couldn't avoid them forever. As I drove to Joan's house, I tried to prepare myself for the inevitable conversation about her mother. The warm glow of their porch light greeted me as I pulled into the driveway, a stark contrast to the cold emptiness I felt inside. Joan met me at the door, her smile strained but genuine. Hey, Dad. Come on in. Frank was already in the kitchen, putting the finishing touches on dinner. Hey, Tom, he said, his voice friendly but guarded. Glad you could make it. As we sat down to eat, the small talk felt forced. Finally, after we'd finished our meal and moved to the living room, Joan took a deep breath. Dad, we need to talk about Mom. I nodded, bracing myself. All right. What about her? Joan exchanged a glance with Frank before continuing. She wants to come see the baby. She's been asking about him a lot. And she wants Greg to come too. The mention of his name sent a spike of anger through me, but I kept my voice calm. And how do you feel about that, Joan? She hesitated, looking down at her hands. I don't know, Dad. I'm torn. I want Mom to be a part of Thomas's life, but I know how much it hurts you. I sighed, feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders. Joan, your mother made her choice, and I made mine. I can't stop her from seeing her grandson, but I won't be a part of it if Greg is there. I hope you understand. Joan nodded, tears welling up in her eyes. I do, Dad. I'm so sorry for everything. I reached out and took her hand. It's not your fault, honey. We'll figure this out. After that difficult conversation, I left Joan's house feeling more alone than ever. The next few weeks were a blur of work gym sessions, and long, lonely nights. The reality of my situation hit hardest during those quiet moments, when the house felt too big and too empty. One evening, as I was sitting in the living room, sipping a glass of bourbon, the phone rang. It was Joan again. Dad, I have some news, she said, her voice hesitant. What's going on, Joan? Mom called me today. She and Greg are planning to get married. The words hit me like a punch to the gut. Married? Already? Yes, Dad. I'm sorry. I took a deep breath, trying to process this new information. Thank you for telling me, Joan. I appreciate it. After I hung up, I sat there in silence, the weight of this new reality pressing down on me. Olivia was moving on, building a new life with Greg, while I was left to pick up the pieces of our broken marriage. The next day, I decided to take a walk through the neighborhood. I needed to clear my head. As I strolled past the familiar houses and manicured lawns, 
I found myself drawn to the small park where Olivia and I used to take Joan when she was a little girl. Sitting on a bench, I watched the children playing, their laughter a bittersweet reminder of happier times. It was here, in this park, that I made a decision. I couldn't let Olivia's betrayal defy the rest of my life. I needed to find a way to move forward to rebuild my happiness, even if it felt impossible right now. That evening, I called Rebecca. Rebecca, I need to finalize the divorce as soon as possible. I want a fresh start. She agreed, and we set the wheels in motion. I also decided to put the house on the market. It was too full of memories, too painful to stay. I needed a new place, a new beginning. As I packed up my belongings, I stumbled upon an old photo album. Flipping through the pages, I saw pictures of our wedding, Joan's first steps, family vacations. Each photo was a reminder of the life Olivia and I had built together, a life that was now over. I paused on a photo of Olivia and me on our honeymoon. We looked so young, so happy, so full of hope. I felt a pang of sorrow for the love we had lost, but also a glimmer of hope for the future. I would find happiness again, even if it took time. As I closed the album and placed it in a box, I felt a sense of closure. The painful reality of my situation was undeniable, but I was determined to move forward. I was ready to start anew, to find peace and joy in a future without Olivia. Christmas came quicker than I expected, and with it, an invitation I couldn't refuse. Joan had asked me to spend the holiday with her and Frank, emphasizing how much it would mean to her and the baby. She also mentioned, with a hesitation in her voice, that Olivia and Greg would be there. I took a deep breath and agreed, knowing this would likely be the final showdown. On Christmas morning, I arrived at Joan's house with a bag of gifts and a heavy heart. The air was crisp and the streets were quiet, blanketed by a soft layer of snow. Joan greeted me at the door, her smile warm and welcoming. Merry Christmas, Dad, she said, hugging me tightly. Merry Christmas, Joan, I replied, trying to match her enthusiasm. Inside, the house was filled with the comforting aroma of roasted turkey and the sound of festive music. Frank was setting the table, and little Thomas was asleep in his crib. I couldn't help but smile as I looked at my grandson, so small and innocent, unaware of the turmoil surrounding his family. Olivia and Greg arrived shortly after, their presence casting a shadow over the cheerful atmosphere. Olivia looked beautiful, but there was a nervousness in her eyes that mirrored my own. Greg, on the other hand, seemed overly confident, his smug expression making my blood boil. We exchanged awkward pleasantries, and I could feel the tension building. Dinner was a strained affair, with four small talk and polite exchanges. Greg dominated the conversation, regaling us with tales of his military exploits, while Olivia hummed on his every word. Finally, after dessert, I decided it was time. I stood up, clearing my throat. I have a few gifts I'd like to give out. I announced, reaching for the bag I had brought. I handed Joan and Frank a large envelope. Joan tore off the wrapping paper and gasped. Dad, this is, this is the deed to your house. I nodded. It's yours now, mortgage-free. A gift for you and your growing family. Joan's eyes filled with tears as she hugged me tightly. Thank you, Dad. This means the world to us. I then turned to Olivia, handing her a small box and an envelope. She opened the box first, revealing a delicate bracelet. As she read the inscription inside, Thank you for the best thirty years, her face fell. Tom, I don't understand, she said, her voice trembling. Read the letter, I replied, my voice steady. She opened the envelope and pulled out the divorce papers. Her eyes widened in shock. Tom, no. Please, we can work this out. I shook my head. Olivia, I've made my decision. This is what I need to move on. And I think you need it too. Greg's face turned red with anger. You can't do this to her, Tom. I turned at him, my expression hard. This is between Olivia and me. Stay out of it. Greg took a step toward me, but before he could say anything, I pulled out a small folder and handed it to Olivia. This is for you too. It's a full report on Greg's activities over the years. I think you'll find it enlightening. Olivia's hands trembled as she opened the folder. As she read through the contents, her face grew pale. Greg, what is this? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. Greg's bravado faltered. Olivia, it's not what it looks like. But Olivia continued reading, tears streaming down her face. You've been lying to me all this time. How could you? I stepped back, feeling a mixture of satisfaction and sorrow. I'm sorry it had to come to this, Olivia. 
but you deserve to know the truth. Greg lunged at me, but I was ready. I pulled out a stun gun I purchased for self-defense and jabbed it into his side. He dropped to the floor, convulsing. Jones screamed, and Frank rushed over to help me restrain him. As Greg lay there, panting and defeated, I looked at Olivia one last time. I love you, Olivia, but I can't live in the shadow of your past anymore. I hope you find what you're looking for, but it won't be with me. With that, I turned and walked out the door, leaving behind the woman I had loved for so long and the man who had torn our lives apart. The cold night air hit me like a slap in the face, but I felt a strange sense of relief. It was over. I was free. I drove home in silence, the events of the evening replaying in my mind. I knew that my future was uncertain, but for the first time in months, I felt a glimmer of hope. I had taken the first step toward reclaiming my life, and I was ready to face whatever came next. As I pulled into my driveway, I looked back at the house one last time. Goodbye, Olivia, I whispered, then turned and walked inside, ready to start anew. The first morning of my new life dawned bright and clear. The house, now devoid of Olivia's presence, felt strangely quiet, but also filled with possibilities. I got out of bed with a sense of purpose I hadn't felt in a long time. Today was the first step towards rebuilding my life. I spent the day packing up the rest of my belongings. It was a bittersweet process, going through the remnants of a life Olivia and I had built together. Old photo albums, mementos from vacations, and gifts we'd exchanged over the years. Each item brought a flood of memories, but I was determined to focus on the future. By the afternoon, I had most of my things packed and ready to move to a storage unit. I had decided to rent a small apartment downtown, something simple and free from the shadows of my past. The process of finding a new place had been surprisingly quick. The real estate agent had shown me a few options, and I had settled on a cozy one-bedroom with a great view of the city skyline. As I carried the last box to my car, Joan pulled up in her SUV. She stepped out, looking worried. Dad, are you sure about this? Moving so soon. I nodded, giving her a reassuring smile. Yes, Joan. I need a fresh start. Staying in that house isn't an option for me anymore. She hugged me tightly. I understand. Just promise me you'll take care of yourself. I will, I assured her, and I'll still be here for you and Thomas. Nothing will change that. The move itself went smoothly. My new apartment was smaller, but it felt liberating to be in a space that was entirely my own. I spent the first evening setting up my things, arranging furniture, and making the place feel like home. As I sat on the balcony, watching the city lights twinkle, I felt a sense of peace I hadn't experienced in a long time. The next few weeks were a blur of activity. I threw myself into work taking on extra projects and responsibilities. I joined a local running club, finding solace in the steady rhythm of my footsteps and the camaraderie of my fellow runners. I also started attending a weekly cooking class, something I had always wanted to do but never found the time for. The instructor, a lively woman named Susan, made each session fun and engaging. One evening after class, Susan approached me. Tom, you have a real talent for this. Have you ever thought about taking more advanced classes? I laughed. Thanks, Susan. I'm just doing this for fun, but I might consider it. She smiled warmly. Well, if you ever want to learn more, I'd be happy to help. It felt good to be making new connections, building a life that was entirely my own. I still thought about Olivia from time to time, but the pain was lessening. The more I focused on myself, the less power those memories had over me. One Saturday morning, as I was jogging through the park, I noticed a woman struggling with a stroller. She was trying to juggle a diaper bag, a coffee cup, and a fussy baby all at once. I jogged over and offered my help. Thank you, she said, her voice filled with relief. I don't usually have this much trouble, but today's been a bit of a mess. No problem, I replied, helping her adjust the stroller. I'm Tom, by the way. Hi, Tom. I'm Emily, she said, offering a tired smile. And this little guy is Ethan. Ethan giggled, reaching out to grab my finger. I laughed. He's adorable. Emily and I chatted for a while as we walked through the park. She was a single mother, recently moved to the city, and was still adjusting to her new life. There was an easy connection between us, a shared understanding of starting over. Over the next few weeks, Emily and I saw more of each other. We met for coffee, went for walks, and slowly, a friendship blossomed. It felt good to have someone to talk to, someone who understood the challenges of rebuilding a life. One evening, as we sat on a bench overlooking the river, Emily turned to me. 
Tom, can I ask you something? Sure, I said, intrigued. Do you ever regret the decisions you've made? Starting over, I mean. I thought for a moment, then shook my head. No, I don't. It's been hard, but I feel like I'm finally living my life for me. It's not always easy, but it's worth it. She smiled, her eyes reflecting the setting sun. I feel the same way. I'm glad we met Tom. Me too, Emily, I said, feeling a warmth spread through my chest. As we sat there, watching the sun dip below the horizon, I realized that this was just the beginning. A new beginning, filled with possibilities. For the first time in a long time, I felt hopeful about the future, and I was ready to embrace whatever came next. The months following my move into the new apartment were transformative. My new life was taking shape, and I was finally starting to reclaim a sense of happiness that had eluded me for so long. The routines I had established were not just distractions, but the foundation of a fulfilling existence. Every morning, I would rise early and go for a run with my new friends from the running club. There was a particular satisfaction in the steady rhythm of our feet hitting the pavement, the shared camaraderie, and the mutual support. It wasn't just about fitness. It was about connection. Emily and I continued to see each other regularly. Our friendship deepened with each passing week, and we began to open up more about our past and our hopes for the future. One evening, after a particularly long walk in the park, Emily invited me over for dinner. As we sat in her cozy kitchen with Ethan asleep in his crib, I felt a sense of contentment. This is nice, I said, savoring the aroma of homemade lasagna. Emily smiled. It is. I've missed having someone to cook for. Well, you're a fantastic cook, I replied, taking another bite. Better than most restaurants in the city. She laughed, a light, musical sound that filled the room with warmth. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad you're here. After dinner, we moved to the living room, and the conversation took a more serious turn. Tom, can I ask you something personal? Emily said, her eyes searching mine. Of course, I replied, curious. Do you think you'll ever be able to fully move on from Olivia? I took a deep breath, considering her question. I think I already have in many ways. What happened with Olivia was painful, but it also showed me what I truly need in a relationship. Trust, honesty, and mutual respect. Those are non-negotiable for me now. Emily nodded, her expression thoughtful. I feel the same way. After my divorce, I realized how important it is to be with someone who values and respects you. We sat in comfortable silence for a moment, then Emily reached out and took my hand. Tom, I'm really glad we met. You brought a lot of joy back into my life. I squeezed her hand gently. The feeling is mutual, Emily. I never thought I could feel this way again, but you've shown me that happiness is possible. As the weeks turned into months, Emily and I grew even closer. We spent weekends exploring the city, visiting museums, and trying out new restaurants. We took Ethan to the zoo, the aquarium, and the park, creating new memories that were filled with laughter and love. One sunny afternoon, we decided to take a day trip to the beach. The sound of the waves, the salty breeze, and the warmth of the sun made it a perfect day. Emily and I watched as Ethan played in the sand, his jiggles a delightful soundtrack to the day. As the sun began to set, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, Emily turned to me. Tom, I think I'm falling in love with you. My heart swelled with emotion. Emily, I feel the same way. You brought so much light into my life. I love you. We kissed, a sweet and tender moment that felt like the beginning of something beautiful. It was a promise of a future filled with love, trust, and happiness. Reclaiming happiness wasn't just about finding love again. It was about rebuilding my life on my terms, finding joy in everyday moments, and surrounding myself with people who cared about me. It was about understanding my worth and knowing that I deserved to be happy. One evening, as Emily and I sat on my balcony, watching the city lights twinkle, she rested her head on my shoulder. What are you thinking about, Tom? She asked softly. I'm thinking about how far we come, I replied, wrapping my arm around her and how excited I am for the future. She smiled, a content and peaceful smile. Me too. As I looked out at the city, I realized that I had finally reclaimed my happiness. It hadn't been easy, and there were still challenges ahead, but I was ready for them. With Emily by my side, I felt a sense of peace and fulfillment that I hadn't felt in years. This was my new beginning, and I was determined to make the most of it. The crisp bottom air brought with it a sense of renewal and change. As the leaves turned golden, and began to fall. I felt a deep sense of closure and readiness for the next chapter of my life. 
Moving on from the pain and heartbreak of the past year wasn't just about leaving behind the memories of Olivia and Greg. It was about embracing a future filled with possibilities. Emily and I had grown inseparable. Our bond strengthened with each passing day, and our shared experiences only brought us closer. One Friday evening, after a cozy dinner at a local bistro, we sat on the balcony of my apartment, sipping wine and enjoying the cool breeze. Tom, Emily said, her voice soft and serious. I've been thinking a lot about us. I turned to her, feeling a mix of curiosity and anticipation. What's on your mind? She took a deep breath, her eyes locking onto mine. I love you, and I love the life we're building together. But I think it's time we took the next step. My heart skipped a beat. What do you mean? Emily smiled, her eyes filled with warmth and love. I mean, I think we should move in together. Create a home not just for us, but for Ethan too. What do you think? The thought of merging our lives felt right. It felt like the natural progression of our relationship, a way to solidify the happiness we had found together. I think it's a wonderful idea, I said, pulling her into a hug. Let's do it. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of packing, organizing, and moving. Emily's apartment was small and cluttered, but together, we found joy in sorting through our belongings and deciding what to keep and what to let go. We found a beautiful townhouse in a quiet neighborhood, with enough space for Ethan to play and grow. Moving day was hectic but filled with excitement. Friends from the running club and Emily's colleagues from work pitched in, making the process smoother and more enjoyable. By the end of the day, we were exhausted but happy, surrounded by boxes and the promise of a new beginning. That evening, as we sat on the floor of our new living room, eating takeout and laughing about the day's events, I felt an overwhelming sense of contentment. This was home, not just a place, but a feeling of belonging and love. The next morning, as the sun streamed through the windows, Emily and I stood in the kitchen, making breakfast. Ethan toddled around, giggling and exploring his new surroundings. It was a simple, perfect moment, and I couldn't help but smile. Tom, can you pass me the eggs? Emily asked, her voice filled with warmth. Sure thing. I replied, handing them to her. This feels good, doesn't it? She nodded, her eyes sparkling. It really does. I'm so happy we're doing this. As we sat down to eat, the doorbell rang. I got up to answer it and was surprised to find Joan standing there, a broad smile on her face. Hi, Dad. Thought I'd come by and see the new place. Joan, it's so good to see you, I said, pulling her into a hug. Come on in. Joan stepped inside, looking around with admiration. Wow, this place is great. You and Emily did a fantastic job. Thanks, I said, feeling a surge of pride. We're really happy here. We spent the day together, catching up and enjoying each other's company. Joan marveled at how happy and relaxed I seemed, and I could see the relief in her eyes. Dad, it's so good to see you like this. You deserve it. Thanks, Joan. I feel like I'm finally where I'm supposed to be. That evening, after Joan left, Emily and I sat on the porch, watching the sunset. Today was perfect, she said, leaning her head on my shoulder. It was, I agreed, feeling a deep sense of peace. I'm glad Joan got to see our new home, and I'm glad she got to see how happy we are. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, life settled into a comfortable rhythm. Emily and I found joy in the everyday moments, from cooking dinner together to taking Ethan to the park. Our home was filled with love and laughter, and I felt a sense of fulfillment I had never known before. One evening, as we sat on the couch, Emily turned to me with a serious expression. Tom, there's something I need to tell you. My heart skipped a beat. What is it? She took my hand, her eyes filled with love. I'm pregnant. The words took a moment to sink in, and then a wave of joy washed over me. Emily, that's amazing. I'm so happy. She smiled tears of happiness in her eyes. Me too, Tom. Me too. As we embraced, I realized that moving on wasn't just about leaving the past behind. It was about embracing the future, building a life filled with love, hope, and new beginnings. And with Emily by my side, I knew that the best was yet to come. This was the start of our forever, and I was ready to face it with an open heart and a hopeful spirit. Moving on had led me to a place of peace and happiness, and I was grateful for every moment that had brought me here. The past was a part of my story, but it didn't define me. The future was ours to create, and I couldn't wait to see what it held.